This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Whether it's your new profession or just a lifelong passion, start your journey to website glory with Squarespace. Check out their amazing all-in-one platform through the link in the description below. More about them in just a bit. For centuries, his name has been synonymous with adventure. Born in rural Devon, Sir Walter Raleigh managed to rise to the very top of Britain's fledgling empire. As a soldier, he fought in both France's religious wars and against the rebellions in Ireland. As a courtier, he became one of Queen Elizabeth's closest confidants, able to destroy a rival with whispered words. But Raleigh's roles went beyond what society expected of him. A natural adventurer, he led expeditions to modern Venezuela to find the legendary El Dorado and funded the establishment of England's first colony in the New World. But while Raleigh would think of himself foremost as an enlightened man, fate would hand him a very different guise, that of a political martyr. Caught on the losing side of Britain's 1603 transfer of power, Raleigh was imprisoned, tortured, and forced to fight for his very life. Nearly crushed by the system, he wound up rolling everything on one final adventure, a daring attempt to wrestle gold from Spain's far-flung colonies. What happens next would ensure his name lived on for eternity. It's customary for biographies of Walter Raleigh to start by mentioning that he came from modest circumstances, but make no mistake, his background was only modest from the point of view of a 16th century English aristocrat. At the moment he was born in the rural English county of Devon around 1554, Raleigh was almost perfectly positioned for greatness. His aunt was the governess of the future Queen Elizabeth, while his half-brother was Humphrey Gilbert, a seafaring adventurer whose own life would deeply influence Raleigh's. So while the family weren't rich, they certainly were well connected. But there was one area where Raleigh's birth put him at a real disadvantage. His family were hardcore Protestants at a time when a hardcore Catholic was on the throne. This meant only one thing, persecution. Although the family avoided the fate of other Protestants in Mary I's reign, they were still in constant danger. As a result, Walter Raleigh would grow up to hold an undying hatred toward Catholics. Still, their persecution didn't last long. In 1558, Mary went off to her eternal reward and was replaced by Protestant Elizabeth I. And just like that, the Raleighs could breathe easy again. Or at least we assume that was the case. In common with many figures of this era, we know remarkably little about Walter Raleigh's early life. In fact, after his birth, we can't say with any certainty what he was doing until roughly 1569. That's because 1569 is when the teenage Raleigh left Devon to fight in France's wars of religion. Kicking off in 1562, the wars of religion pitted France's Catholic majority against its Protestant Huguenots in an on-again, off-again fight featuring brutal massacres. Although he fought in France for less than a year, Raleigh witnessed enough human depravity to make a deep impression on him. But probably not in the way that you might be thinking. When the time came, the teenage boy would himself become adept at the art of bloodshed. Fighting over, Raleigh again dropped out of the historical record until 1572, when he turned up studying in Oxford. Doubtless, he made a hell of an impression there. By this time, the boy had grown into a dashing, dark-haired man who, at six foot, towered over most of his contemporaries. Basically, he was every young maiden's dream of a tall, dark, handsome stranger. With one exception. All his life, Raleigh would speak with a strong Devonshire burr, an accent about as sexy as witnessing a beloved grandparent dressed in leather bondage gear. Still, the 1570s would see Raleigh embark on two important love affairs. The first was with writing. The second, far more important, was with exploration. It all started in June 1578, when Raleigh's seafaring half-brother, Sir Humphrey Gilbert, organized an expedition to try and find the fabled Northwest Passage. Excited by the prospect, Raleigh joined his siblings' fleet as captain of the Falcon, only to witness firsthand the expedition become a disaster. Scattered by storms, damaged by desertions, Gilbert's expedition eventually gave up on the passage and instead turned to attacking Spanish ships for loot. It was such a failure, it could have put Raleigh off exploring for life. But no. Something about the high seas, the adventure, the privateering seems to have touched Raleigh's soul. From that moment on, the boy would be destined for a life of adventure. 
The first of these adventures came in the spring of 1580. Jailed for taking part in a brawl, Raleigh got his friends to pull a few strings and instead have him transferred to the army's officer corps. Before the year was out, he was in Ireland taking part in the Siege of Smerwick. The Smerwick Siege is infamous today because when the fort surrendered to the English, they gave no quarter, butchering everyone inside. One of those who gleefully carried out the mass executions was Walter Raleigh. In the aftermath of the massacre, Raleigh returned to London with some secret documents discovered on the bodies. Although he would spend the next year back in Ireland, his star was already beginning to rise. He was no longer just some Devon boy with a hankering for adventure. He was fast becoming a force to be reckoned with. Despite sounding like Warsaw Gummidge's inbred cousin, Walter Raleigh never had much trouble with the ladies. Although tales of him as a 16th century James Bond with lovemaking skills to match uh, later fabrications, we know he caught many a girl's eye. In Ireland, for instance, he sired an illegitimate daughter. But his biggest catch came in December of 1581. That was the month he somehow turned Queen Elizabeth's head. A ton has been written about the courtship between Walter Raleigh and Queen Elizabeth I, with the nature of their relationship portrayed as anything from intellectual equals to definitely sleeping together. Certainly, Raleigh seems to have wormed his way into the Queen's heart. Not long after meeting her, he was made an squire of the court, and old Liz left no doubt that he was her favorite. On the other hand, a lot of the stories, such as Raleigh laying his cloak down so the Queen could avoid stepping in a puddle, are almost certainly untrue. Sexual or not, though, Raleigh proved useful to the Queen, and this usefulness paid off big time. From Elizabeth's perspective, Raleigh was both an astute courtier, writing her elegant poems, and a natural spin doctor, a master of backstabbing, of political cover-ups, of justifying controversial decisions. He also seems to have worked as a secret agent on occasion, such as when the Queen dispatched him to the Low Countries to personally retrieve a message from William the Silent. Still, it'd be hard to claim Elizabeth wasn't a little obsessed with her new and handsome courtier. The gifts showered on Raleigh would embarrass a billionaire showing off for his trophy wife. In 1583, Raleigh was gifted the run of Durham House, a magnificent mansion sitting along the Strand. That same year, the Queen bestowed upon him a monopoly over wine, effectively meaning everyone selling wine in Britain had to pay Raleigh for the privilege. Two years later, he'd be granted a similar monopoly on broadcloth, plus a knighthood, plus titles like Vice Admiral of the West, Lord Lieutenant of Cornwall, and Lord Warden of the Stannaries, a fancy word for Cornwall's lucrative tin mines. Oh, and in 1586, he was also granted 42,000 acres in Munster for his service in Ireland, about three times as much as everyone else received. But while Raleigh's rise at court was dizzying, it also changed him. The more attention Elizabeth showed, the more Raleigh started living up to her image of him as a dashing, flamboyant adventurer. He started dressing extravagantly, decking himself out in pearls, acting like he was constantly performing for an invisible audience. And in a sense, he was. Later in life, Raleigh would write that it's better to befriend rich people because only they can give you the money you need to stand on your own two feet. What was his behavior at court but a way to ensure that the money kept rolling in? Come 1587, Raleigh was established enough to be made captain of the guard, effectively in charge of Elizabeth's personal protection. Although he'd have to wait until 1591 to take up the post when the current holder died, it still should have been the pinnacle of his career. But by now, Raleigh was already moving on to bigger and better things. No longer content with dreary old England, he had set his sights on conquering the world. And if you want to conquer a new world, it's time to get help with our friends from Squarespace. Now more than ever, people are getting creative with their time. They're reaching into their savings account to start that new business, or they're launching a local politics blog to share their opinions with their friends and neighbors. The world is yours, and Squarespace is the perfect web tool to help you show it whatever you like. It's the platform to use when you're ready to get started on that web project you've been thinking about. Are you looking to get in and out quickly without thinking too much about your website and what it should look like? Well, just use one of their quick and beautiful templates to make a website that is fresh for you. Or maybe you're more of a hands-on person and you've got lots of opinions and ideas about exactly what your site should look like. Squarespace gives you all the customization options you could ever want with no updates, no patches, no technical BS to worry about. Once you're done setting up your website, tinkering with the design if you're so inclined, or maybe just playing with some of the colors, there are so many extra features that Squarespace provides so that your website can 
can thrive. Email campaigns, patronage portals, social integrations, member-only areas, and customer support. It's everything you could ever want all in one place. And look, this isn't just another advertiser partnership for me. When I launched a website for another channel, I do mega projects at megaprojects.net. Well, of course, I use Squarespace to make it. And I think I've made an elegant, but super functional website. And I really don't have any skills in design or websites or anything like that. It was all super easy. So when you're ready to get started on the next project of yours, big or small, if it involves a website, it's got to be with Squarespace. Right now, you can go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash biographics to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. There's a link below and let's get back to it. Weirdly, the best thing that ever happened to Walter Raleigh was probably his half-brother dying. So Humphrey Gilbert had been a titan of his age, the sort of guy we should probably cover in his own biographics video. Let us know in the comments if you want that. As long as he was around, Raleigh would always be content to be in his shadow, a man standing beside greatness rather than being great himself. But in September 1583, Gilbert drowned on an expedition aged only 43, and simply standing in his shadow was no longer possible. When Raleigh received the news, he made an important decision. He would carry on with his half-brother's plans alone. At the time of his death, Gilbert had been preparing the grounds for a colonizing expedition to America. Raleigh now picked up those plans and ran with them, assembling a team at Durham House to make them a reality. And so began the story of England's first colony in the New World. Although Raleigh wouldn't physically help establish it, Elizabeth being unwilling to let him stray too far from court, he would both bankroll it and provide logistics. In 1584, that meant supporting the first scouting mission that sailed to what we now call the Outer Banks of North Carolina, and returns with two Algonquian speakers, when she and Manteo. The arrival of these Native Americans in London caused a sensation. It's worth remembering that at this time, going to America wasn't simple. It wasn't even difficult. It was an operation of fiendish complexity. One account we read compared it to the Apollo program with the 1584 expedition being like Apollos 7 and 8, basically proving that it could be done. With the success of that expedition, Raleigh and his team were able to pivot to their own moon landing. In early 1585, Elizabeth granted Raleigh the title of Lord and Governor of Virginia, his colony named after the Virgin Queen herself. That same year, an all-male crew set out to Roanoke Island to establish a temporary camp there that they could use as a base for future expeditions. It lasted less than a year before the men gave up and came home. But Raleigh wasn't deterred. In spring 1587, the third expedition set out. It would be this expedition that changed history. Hundreds of Londoners left on ships that swept across the Atlantic's dangerous waters, the 16th century equivalent of a SpaceX fleet off to colonize Mars. Although it would be later eclipsed by Jamestown, the first colony was the start of something massive. It was with Raleigh's expedition that the seeds of English North America were sown. That history witnessed the first glimpses of what would become the USA. From the dizzying heights of the Declaration of Independence to the hideous lows of the Trail of Tears, everything sprang from this one moment. Which is curious when you remember the Roanoke Colony was an abysmal failure. Despite boasting the first English child born on American soil, the colony soon ran low on supplies. Governor John White was dispatched to Britain to get help, only for war with Spain to break out, trapping him across the Atlantic. By the time White returned in 1590, the Roanoke colony had been abandoned. All that was left was the word Croatern, carved in a post, a reference to both a nearby island and a nearby tribe. Of the first English colonists in American history, was no sign. Back in London, Raleigh was personally blamed for the colony's failure and the presumed deaths of its residents. While this isn't really fair, it still left a stain on his reputation that he struggled to shake off. But while being implicated in the loss of hundreds of lives wouldn't be enough to dislodge Raleigh from his position at the Queen's side, what came next would soon turn him into a pariah. It's time for Walter Raleigh to get married. To this day, all sorts of legends still cling to Raleigh's name. For instance, people insist that he introduced both the potato and tobacco to England, having brought them over from Virginia. In reality, the potato spread across Europe after arriving in Spain, while tobacco had reached England as early as 1571. At most, Raleigh probably made smoking a fashionable activity at Elizabeth's court, yet his fame was so great that people would attribute the entire concept to him. 
But just as odd tales clung to Raleigh, so too did the man himself believe in some wild stuff. Wildest of all might have been the legend of El Dorado. The city of gold that was said to exist in South America's interior, El Dorado's mirage dragged many Europeans to their deaths over the decades. While Raleigh would survive his own hunt for the city, he swallowed the story as easily as any conquistador. In 1595, he even managed to take four ships up the Orinoco River into modern Venezuela in a bid to get the treasure. Though prizes for guessing exactly how much mythical gold he succeeded in bringing back to England. Just a few years earlier, Raleigh might have been able to shrug off such a failure, but by 1595, things had changed. From Queen Elizabeth's favourite, he'd now fallen to a position best described as most hated man in Britain. And he'd done it by breaking the Queen's heart. Back in 1588, around the time the Roanoke colonists were wondering where the hell the fresh supplies were, Raleigh started an affair with Elizabeth Throckmorton. One of the Queen's maids of honour, Elizabeth, better known as Bess, was a strong-willed woman who was easily Raleigh's equal. Sadly, that sort of instant attraction didn't count for much when the Queen herself was fawning over Raleigh, and the two were forced to keep their affair secret, which was all fine and dandy until Bess fell pregnant in 1591. Determined to do the decent thing, Raleigh married Bess in secret, and they both kind of just hung around the edges of the court, whistling nonchalantly and hoping no one would notice the brand new baby. It was a dream as quixotic as finding El Dorado. In May of 1592, word of the marriage and the baby finally got back to the queen, who detonated with the force of a thousand Hiroshimas. Raleigh and Bess were arrested and thrown into the Tower of London. It was only when Raleigh Raleigh bribed the queen with insane amounts of treasure that she agreed to release him, but by then it was too late. The baby died the same year it was born, never knowing a normal family life. Although Bess was likewise released in the wake of the tragedy, both she and Raleigh were banned from court, their names reduced to mud. Still, Raleigh was convinced that this wasn't the end, that he could charm his way back into the Queen's good books. Certainly by 1600, Elizabeth seems to have been thawing on him. Following a successful attack on the Spanish city of Cadiz, Raleigh was made governor of Jersey. It seemed like the old rake had done it, that he'd used his endless charm and talent for adventure to pull his life back from the abyss. Alas, it was all just a temporary illusion. Elizabeth I died on March the 24th, 1603, at the age of 69. Although her death wasn't a shock, it was still like someone had placed a bomb under Raleigh's carefully cultivated life. She'd been his benefactor, his protector. Even when he was out of favor, the queen had allowed him to keep his manor and monopolies. Now she was gone, and suddenly the vultures were circling. All those people Raleigh had pissed off in the Elizabethan era by being such a brown noser were out for revenge. Although Raleigh might have assumed he could turn even this unlucky break around, he was wrong. From now on, things were going to be all downhill. Although his rise had taken decades, Sir Walter Raleigh's fall was finished in barely half a year. In the wake of Elizabeth's death, James VI of Scotland ascended to the English throne as James I, already ill-disposed towards annoying, adventure-loving fops. When Raleigh first met the new king, he received less a smile than an unimpressed grimace. Still, Raleigh was at least allowed to perform his official functions at Elizabeth's funeral, but it was just a final nod to the departed queen. The moment his benefactor was in the grounds, Raleigh's life spectacularly imploded. He was thrown out of his mansion of two decades, Durham House, given barely a fortnight to plan his move. Then he was stripped of his role as captain of the guards before losing the right to both his monopolies. It was a humiliating reversal of fortune, a kick in the nuts from fate that Raleigh felt was wholly undeserved. Unfortunately, though, this was just the beginning. To understand what happened next, we need to quickly introduce a couple of characters. George and Henry Brooke were aristocratic brothers, with Henry being both the 11th Baron Cobham and a close friend of Raleigh. They were also suspected of involvement in two utterly harebrained schemes known as the By Plot and the Main Plot to kidnap King James and either force him to make pro Catholic declarations or just sell him as a prisoner to Spain. When the By Plot was discovered in July of 1603, George Brooke was duly arrested, only to implicate both his brother and Walter Raleigh as co-conspirators. Likely, Brooke was just throwing out names, trying to buy himself some leniency, but the guards arrested both Raleigh and the Baron Cobham. It was here that Raleigh made his fatal mistake. Realizing he too might be tortured, he wrote a vague letter to the Privy Council, saying that he'd always thought his friend the Baron was a bit suspicious and he should have reported it earlier. 
Rather than release Rally, the council showed the letter to Cobham, who immediately flipped into full kamikaze mode. Declaring himself guilty, Cobham also told his interrogators that Rally was the plot's ringleader. Although Cobham retracted his confession a few days later, the damage had been done. Rally was sent to trial in November that year. Things looked so bleak that he tried to commit suicide in his cell by stabbing himself. When that failed, he was dragged through the streets of London and out to face the judges at Winchester. It's a mark of how far Rally's stock had fallen that the guards didn't think that he'd make it to the trial. The crowds in London tried to lynch him, throwing rocks and abuse, cursing Raleigh's name. By the time he made it to Winchester, Raleigh was a shell of a man, frightened, damaged, caught up in a legal system, determined to find him guilty. Which is what makes what happened next so impressive. On the day of his trial, November 17, 1603, Raleigh sat in a packed courtroom before a panel of biased judges and systematically demolished them. Using his incredible learning, Raleigh was able to quote precedents from English law that showed the evidence was too flimsy to convict him. When that failed, he pivoted to creating watertight cases from logic and common sense. When the judges dismissed them, he made a scholarly plea based on biblical law. The crowd absolutely ate it up. Raleigh had walked into that chamber, one of the most hated men in Britain, and by the end of the day, he had his enemies eating out of his hands. It helped that he had a talent for drama, such as his ending flourish when he produced a new secret confession written by Cobham that exonerated Raleigh. But impressive as Raleigh's hand was, it overplayed it. With what we can only imagine was the slyest smile in history, the judge produced an even newer confession from Cobham that basically said, LOL, the confession I gave to Raleigh is fake. He's totally guilty. And with that, Walter Raleigh realized that his ace in the hole had been nothing more than a dog-eared joker. That same day, Raleigh was convicted and sentenced to death, a penalty to be carried out as swiftly and as nastily as possible. But while his sentence would indeed be carried out, there would be nothing swift about it. Nobody in that crowded courtroom in 1603 could have guessed it, but Raleigh wouldn't be executed for another 15 years. If you've ever wondered what life in the Tower of London was like, you probably assumed it involved adjectives like nasty and short, but not where Walter Raleigh was concerned. After his public performance at trial, James I felt leery about executing someone so popular. Instead, he had the adventurer locked away in what we can only describe as luxury. Raleigh was not only given two rooms in the Tower, but a garden for exercise, a place to keep his laboratory and unlimited visits from his wife. He was even allowed to write, composing his The History of the World, all while not just imprisoned, but technically dead. Dead. Yep, dead. Although James couldn't bring himself to actually kill Raleigh, he still had him declared legally dead. Raleigh, though, was already planning his resurrection. This wasn't a plan to physically escape the tower. No, he wanted to walk out a free man, to be pardoned by James, to go back to being a favorite. Raleigh realized there was only one way to drag himself to the very top again. He was going to have to find El Dorado. From our 21st century perspective, we know this plan was the dictionary definition of bananas. El Dorado didn't exist. It was just a legend conquistadors believed in to justify all the hardship and genocide. Raleigh might as well have gambled everything on discovering an unlimited supply of cheese on the moon. In the early 17th century, though, it was much more believable. The Spanish were already bringing silver back from the New World at a crazy rate. Why couldn't England get in on that action? In 1616, King James finally agreed to release Raleigh for him to go and look for El Dorado. But there would be conditions. The first was that Raleigh would be watched closely to stop him simply hightailing it to France. The second was that Raleigh must not, repeat, not antagonize the Spanish who James was trying to live peacefully with. It was this last condition that would seal Raleigh's fate. Raleigh's expedition left Plymouth in June of 1617, arriving in South America that November. The plan was to sail up the Orinoco through Spanish territory and into the interior. At the last moment, though, Raleigh came down with fever and had to stay on a boat at the river's mouth while his men did all the exploring. That would turn out to be very, very unfortunate. Raleigh's troops sailed up the river and almost immediately attacked and looted the Spanish settlement of San Thom. Failing to find El Dorado, they instead panicked and burned the settlement and then turned around and hightailed it back to England. And that was it for Raleigh's last desperate shot at redemption. The fleet reached Plymouth in mid-1618 to discover word of the massacre had beaten them home. The moment Raleigh stepped off the boat, he was arrested. Initially held in West Country, he twice tried to escape to France, and when that failed, he wrote a pamphlet trying to whip up anti-Spanish sentiment. By now, he'd pissed off King James for the last time. That October, James convened a special panel of judges to ask if there was a legal basis for reinstating Raleigh's 1603 sentence of execution. Long story short, the judges said yes. 
On October 29, 1618, Walter Raleigh was led out to the scaffolding. There, he made a 45-minute speech summarizing his career and asking for the crowd to pray for his soul. Then he knelt down, closed his eyes, and the executioner swung his axe. It took two blows to sever Raleigh's head, and once the deed was done, his wife Bess demanded the head be placed in a velvet bag. Till her dying day, Bess would carry that bag with her wherever she went. At the moment of his death, Sir Walter Raleigh was probably one of the most interesting figures in British history. While he'd done a lot of adventuring and risen from a rural background to the top of London society, he'd also died having failed to either establish a North American colony or discover El Dorado. Yet from our vantage points, we can see that his failure was only temporary. Even before he died, Raleigh was living in a world in which England had a permanent colony in America, just like the one he'd envisaged. Less than two years after his execution, the Mayflower Pilgrims would leave Plymouth for the New World, and history would change forever. Of course, there's only so much credit we can give Raleigh for all these later colonies. After all, his Roanoke failed spectacularly. Yet still, it was Walter Raleigh who did it first, who pioneered a concept that would reshape the entire world. It was a concept he failed at, but one that laid the groundwork for all that came after. If that's what failure looks like, then we can judge that Raleigh was probably the most impressive failure in all of English history. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, please do check out our fantastic sponsor, Squarespace, who I'm linking to below. And thank you for watching.